we're going to have us a good time reading and going through the word. I'm going to go into uh, verse number one. Here it is. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. That's a powerful statement. You may be seated. It's a powerful statement. It's a bold statement. What in the world? I mean, come on now. Elijah, seriously, you are uh, you're saying some pretty strong stuff here. See, if you like gutsy people, you're going to really admire Elijah. I mean, this guy, he steps right out there. He walks straight up to the most powerful man in the kingdom. And he says, you know what? Until I say so, the clouds will not release rain. It's just not going to happen. And until I say so, there will be no dew on the ground in the mornings. I like that kind of faith. How do you get that kind of faith? Well, I'm glad you asked. And I'd like to talk to you today for the next little bit about this subject, essential evaluation. Everybody say essential evaluation. evaluation. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for allowing us to be able to just years and years, for thousands of years, be able to dissect your word and let us know, God, that you have spoken to us through your word today by letting it come alive in our hearts. Let us see clearly what you want us to see. And those that are here in the building and those watching online, God, minister through this word today in Jesus' name. We pray and everybody said amen. amen. So if you If you have kids, you're probably pretty aware of the question-asking phase. Question-asking phase. You know, there's tons of questions over and over. Sometimes they are good questions. Sometimes they are quite literally not so good. I better say it that way. Not so good questions. You know, just a lot of the whys. Why? 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 Mm -hmm. Just, Just do it, okay? I was looking up the, uh, some funny questions that some kids asked, and I, I, I came across a few that I'd like to share with you today. One kid said, how did people make the first tools if they didn't have any tools? <laughs> okay, okay. One kid says, how come I can't see my eyes? I don't know. This one says, do newborn babies know they're alive yet? <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, This is a good one. This is going to make you feel real old. You ready? Why do we say hang up the phone? (laughs) They're like, it's a red button that you push. I don't know why we're hanging it up. Here's one that asks, does the letter W start with a D? (laughs) Took a few of you. You're like, well, carry the two. Here's my favorite. Are you ready? Mom, when you were a kid, did you have to quarantine for COVID one through 18? (laughs) <laughs> so over the years, uh, my son, he's asked a lot of questions. And even though we all tend to slow down on asking questions as we get older, for his sake, I hope he never stops. So here's what I love about questions. They cause you to evaluate. Everybody say evaluate. evaluate. There's a lot of people that are living unevaluated lives. They're not willing to look deep enough for long enough to ask some difficult but valuable questions. You know somebody right now, if you thought about it long enough, that if they would just ask themselves some tough questions and be willing to give some honest answers, like, why do I seem to get into some problematic relationships? Why do I always run into the same kind of issues on my job? Why, why don't I ever seem to stay coarse on anything? Why do I always start something and not able to finish it? And if we'd stop long enough to evaluate some things, maybe we would find the source of this problem. Maybe we would stop it instead of repeating it. Here's something you might want to write down in your notes, and I always encourage you, please, Please bring something to write down in these messages because I seriously doubt you can memorize it all. Here it is. We can only improve in areas we evaluate. See, a lot, 
A lot of people say that experience is the best teacher. Well, that sounds good, but there's something missing in that statement because you can experience the same thing over and over again and not get any better at it. See, if experience was the best teacher, then getting older automatically made you much wiser. But that's not always the case because there's years are rolling by. And just because of that, that doesn't mean that we're getting in a better place. And just because you've got experience in something doesn't mean that, that people want to listen to what you have to say or they're going to follow the example that you've set. Somebody says, well, I've been doing it this way for 20 years. Well, that's great. But what does your pattern produce? Are you moving forward or are you moving backwards? See, experience is not the best teacher. Evaluated experience is the best teacher. The question is, are you growing? I want everybody to say evaluation is essential. Here's my question for you this morning. Are you evaluating your faith journey? Are you stepping back from where you are and you say, just ask yourself this question. Am I in a better place in my walk with God this year than I was last year? How is my journey with God going? Am I in a deeper place with him? Is my faith stronger with him? Am I walking closer to him now than I was this time last year? See, if you don't evaluate your faith journey, you can find yourself in cycles of dysfunction and cycles of disappointment. Just because you've been following Jesus for the past five years doesn't mean that you've made five years worth of progress. The sad truth for some people is that they live the same kind of year for five years in a row. And they've experienced the same ups and the same downs and they've fallen in the same pits and they've been saved by God's grace and then they were able to climb back out of that pit again. But sometimes we take those two steps forward and then two steps back. They've got experience, but they're missing a key ingredient. To tell somebody beside you, say you have to evaluate in order to improve. Now, did they receive it? If they didn't lay hands on their head and tell them again, I'm just kidding. Some of y'all did it. Y'all were quick to do it. I like that. I have to have some more exercises like that in church. Today, I want to give you three questions taken from the life of Elijah that will help you evaluate your faith. See, I can't give you the answer, but I can give you the questions that if evaluated will lead to improvement in your life and in your walk with God. Number one. What do you seek first? See, in this setting of scripture we're studying today, Elijah finds himself in a very unstable situation. Some of you can identify with that. And maybe not right now, but at some point in the recent past, a very unstable situation. The nation of Israel is in the state of moral decay. The king Ahab is, he's married to a Phoenician princess named Jezebel. Everybody say boo. Yeah, she deserves a boo. Her father was the high priest of the false god Baal, and she was devoted, a devoted worshiper of Baal as well. And together, Ahab and Jezebel, they had turned the hearts of the majority of the people of Israel away from the one true living God towards Baal. That obviously presents a problem for Elijah, who is serving as one of the faithful few prophets that refused to turn to Baal worship. So during this time period, well-known prophets, they had access to the king. In fact, the kings would often send for these prophets, and especially when they had to make, make big decisions because they wanted some divine guidance. And that would turn into a very dangerous proposition for the prophet because most of the time, and I want you to get this, most of the time, the divine guidance they wanted to hear was their own opinion repeated back to them. Oh, my most of the time, the divine guidance they wanted to hear was their own opinion repeated back to them. Oh, God, give me a word. Give me a word. Give me a word. But what I'm really looking for, Lord, is just you kind of like give me my opinion back to me. And that's kind of a confirmation that I'm still in charge. Oh, my. Let's keep going. Publicly correcting kings was a great, wasn't really a great career move. And it could easily cost you your life. See, the faith foundation of the entire nation was being destroyed. And in the middle of the chaos, Elijah goes to seek a word from the Lord. 
And then he goes to Ahab to announce what he's heard. Let's look at 1 Kings 17 and 1 again. We're going to go through this several times in today's message, but I want you to get it. As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. See, Elijah has clarity in the time of confusion. So he knows exactly what God wants him to do. And he's, he's certain that he's going to, it's going to happen just the way that God told him it would. There's a reason why he's so confident. See, before he took any action, before he went to the king, before he made the bold statement, before he stepped out in faith, he went to God first. Can I ask you to spend a moment honestly evaluating this question? In the good times and in the bad times, What do you seek first? When all is going well and things are all just kind of just just going smooth, smooth sailing, there's not really much problems, there's not a whole lot of pain or need or worry, what do you seek first? When the bottom falls out, when everything seems to be going awry and the unexpected happens and the decisions have to be made, what do you seek first? As for Elijah, he sought God first. Well, Pastor Jason, how do you know that? Well, I'm going to tell you. James 5 and 17, it references this situation and tells us very clearly that Elijah was a human being, even as we are. I love this. This is James. James is like, listen, let me just make it clear. He's a human being, and just like we are, and he prayed earnestly. He's letting us know that all of us as humans need to do one thing, pray earnestly. He says he's a human being just like we are. Elijah's first response, not his second, not his third response, was to seek God in his situation. Well, what do you seek first? Because it's easy to get into the habit of bypassing God when we, you know, it's when we, until we get into a code red situation. It's a five alarm fire and now it's time to talk to the Lord. Everything is falling apart and then it's starting to crumble around us and we're saying, oh God, it's time to get on my knees. And you've heard somebody say it before. Oh, I've done all that I can do. Now it's time to take it to the Lord in prayer. Well, what in the world? We got to flip that around because it's what we're supposed to do first is take it to the Lord in prayer. And then we do what all we can do. Could it be that sometimes God allows difficult moments so that we'll wake up and start seeking him first? Could it be that sometimes he allows crisis because it pushes us to go to him instead of the alternatives of being just run by our situations? Am I saying that God is sending destruction to your life? No, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that he can use the painful situation that you're experiencing to produce change. Some of us know that the faith and the resilience that we have right now, and I want you to think about this, the faith and the resilience that you have now are the result of what you've been through before that God has brought you out of and he showed himself strong in. If we hadn't walked through that season of heartache in the past, we wouldn't have the prayer life that we have right now in the present. If we hadn't gone through that season of uncertainty in the past, we wouldn't have the confidence in God that we have right now in the present. If we hadn't been in that desperate time of need, in the desperate place of deliverance that we had to have at that moment, and watch God bring us out of that difficult dilemma, we wouldn't have the worship that we have right now. Sometimes God allows the circumstance to be a catalyst for change. What you seek first is very important. What do you run to? Who do you run to? Could it be that the painful chapters in your past were actually a gift that's producing something powerful in the present? See, I know that they overlooked you But that rejection pushed you to seek God on a deeper level. It was a gift. I know that people, they promised that they would stay and they didn't stay. But that loneliness pushed you to seek God on a deeper, deeper level. And what the enemy meant for bad, God turned into a gift for a catalyst for your relationship with him to grow. 
I know that they hurt you, but the journey of healing that you've been on pushed you to seek God on a deeper level. It was a gift. Whatever you've been through, it didn't kill you. It didn't take you out. But what God turned it around and he says, hey, I know the enemy meant to destroy you. I mean, I know the enemy wanted to kill you. I know they wanted to mess up your family. But I used that as a situation that would turn your life towards me and grow your relationship with him. It was a gift. He didn't cause it to happen, but sometimes he allows it to happen. What is it that you've been going through that you've been almost tempted to curse God because of it? Tempted to say, God, how dare you allow this to happen in my life? And he says, oh, if you only knew that this is a gift that I'm allowing to happen because it's going to turn you into a stronger man or woman of God. And you'll be able to use it as a testimony of how strong I truly can be in someone's life. Here's the point. We don't have to wait until the crisis mode kicks in to go to him. We can seek him first all the time. What do you seek when you're in tough situations. Here's the second one. We need to spend time evaluating this question here. Where do you find confidence? Everybody say confidence. I think one of the reasons that people lose confidence is because they try something and fail. Because, because of that failure, they refuse to get back up again. Today, is, it's all about evaluating, and it's, it's, just, it's good to be honest with ourselves here. And the truth for some of us is that over the past year, we've lost some confidence. I don't want you to get to raise your hand because that's a good way to lose more confidence. <laughs> but I believe a lot of us have lost some confidence over the last year. Your boldness has been replaced by some fear, maybe some doubt, maybe some uncertainty. Maybe within the last year that you believed for something and, and you, didn't get, you gave your best to make it happen and it just didn't happen. But it just didn't turn out the way you thought it would. And you tried for that promotion and you didn't get it. And you left out of that situation with a lot less confidence than you went into it with. And it's, it's just gotten a lot more difficult to take that kind of risk again. So you tried to make some changes to the way you approach your finances. And then maybe it, you had a plan. You had this. It all worked out. But it just unexpected expenses or changes on the job. And the things, everything just kind of went out the window. And you lost your confidence as a result. And you decided to, you just maybe, maybe I shouldn't try again because I may fail. Maybe you tried to make some changes to the way you approach your health. Maybe you had a plan and it just didn't work out and it just got off track. And you say, I just lost my confidence in myself to be able to see things through. Failure is one way that we lose confidence. Another way we lose confidence is by listening to the wrong voices. Who you let into your inner circle is incredibly important. Because the things that they say can either build you up they can tear you down. Some of you need a lot, need to get a lot more serious about small groups this next semester because you need people around you that are going to help you. You need people around you that are going to speak life into you. You need people around you that are going to believe in you and believe with you for things. You need people that are going to speak confidence into your life. Some of you are surrounded by people that are continually drain you. They never fill you. Their words pull you down. They consume your time. They consume your energy. They're always talking and never listening. They're always taking and they're never giving. And you feel like you don't deserve more than that. You don't feel, you feel like you need this. You feel like they ha if you left them, there's something terrible would happen or whatever it may be. But the truth is, some of you have surrounded yourself that are with people that are continually pulling you down and pulling your confidence with it. Some of you are surrounded by people who are draining you and don't fill you. I, I want you to take a minute and evaluate the people closest to you. Are they pushing you forward? Are they pulling you backward? Are they giving you confidence or are they draining your confidence? Well, the voices around us can cause us to lose confidence, but I can also tell you that the voice inside of you is, is another way that we lose confidence. Because each of us has an inner ongoing monologue. And your self-talk can either build you up or it can tear you down. See, what thoughts get in, inside of your head that get stuck on repeat in your brain 
What you hear when you're all by yourself. Forget what other people are telling you. What are you telling yourself? What are you speaking to yourself? We say things to ourselves that we would never tell another human being. We would never say something so mean to someone else, but we say it to ourselves on a regular basis. We criticize ourselves in a way that we would never criticize someone else. And instead of confidence in God, and confidence in the things that he's doing in and through us. A lot of us are having an endless conversation with ourselves about all the things that we are not and all the things we can never be. You'll never get it right. You'll never measure up. Any minute now, they're going to find out that you're a fake, that you're a fraud. Let me help somebody today. We're not supposed to be arrogant, but we're also not supposed to walk around confessing and believing that we are worthless. We're not supposed to walk around with our head down, with our shoulders slumped over, saying, I just don't know if I'll ever make it. I don't know if, I'm, if I'll ever add up. I don't know if I'll ever be accepted. I don't know if I have a calling. I don't know if I'm gifted. I don't, oh, and walking around. No, that is not the way God planned it to be. We're supposed to have confidence in God and confidence in what he can do in and through us. Can I tell you that you that why some of us don't have the boldness that we had that we, that that we like to have when it comes to the thing of things of God? You want me to tell you why we don't? It's be, why why is it that we don't step out in faith more? It's because we believe in Him, but we don't believe that He can do anything worthwhile through us. So we settle for far less than He intends to do in and through us. So we, we don't dream, we don't try, we don't trust, we don't step out, and instead we accept this idea that we're never going to achieve and that we're never going to excel. And I want to tell somebody here today, God has more for you than that. Let, let, me, let me tell you something. You ever, you ever find it interesting that when somebody's up here and needs healing, that you have a lot of faith for them, but when it's time for you to get healing... You struggle to have the faith. You ever find it interesting that you're, somebody says, I need a new job. And you're like, "Ooh, they're going to get it. I believe it. I believe God's going to give them a new job. And when it comes time for you to get a new job, you're like, "Ooh, I don't know. I don't know, man. I, you know, all my, you know, this. it's because we're too caught up in our own self thinking that we're thinking about all the things that we're not. We're thinking about all the things that we've got wrong with us, all the stuff that they're not going to accept with us, all the stuff that my, my faith, I'm having a hard time believing that God's going to do this for me because you know yourself too well. What I'm trying to tell you is we need to get outside of that. Get outside of thinking that we're not worth it because I assure you that God died for you specifically and that you are worth every part that he died for. You're worth every stripe that he received. You're worth every nail that he got in his hands and in his feet. You're worth every bit of it. I want you to know today, if you need healing, you need to receive it. You need to believe it. You need to stop telling yourself you're not worth it. The Apostle Paul, he said this, and we know this one real well. Let's see if I can give you a, get a little nugget out of this that maybe you hadn't, hadn't looked at before too much. But it says, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's really good. Yes, he was confident in God, but he was also confident in what God can do through him. See, he didn't plant over 14 churches with zero confidence. So you don't lead the way that Paul did with, without, and just give the direction that he did without confidence. You can't be used in the supernatural the way that Paul was and operate in the gifts of the Spirit the way that Paul did with zero confidence. Here's this, I want you to write it down if you can. Confidence is a close cousin of faith. Y'all didn't know faith had a cousin. There's more to faith than confidence, but confidence is part of the equation that produces faith. See, some of us are trying to have faith while we have very little confidence. I'm talking to you now. I know I'm just doing some teachy type stuff right here. We're going to get into some fun stuff in a minute, but let me tell you, listen, it's hard to have faith with no confidence. Somebody said, build up my faith, God, build up my faith. Now, well, you need some confidence in the process. See, Doing anything significant for the kingdom of God requires boldness. You have to be able to call the things that are not as though they were. 
And, and you have to be able to look past what is and see what could be. And you have to step into situations where nothing's happening and believe that God is going to turn it around and that he's going to use you to do it. Hold on, I'm going to say it again. He's going to use you to do it. Some of us need to get our boldness back. We, need to, we serve a great God who is ready to do great things in and through us. So where do we get, where do we get our, com, our confidence from? In our opening text, Elijah told King Ahab, he says, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. He says, as soon as, as sure, okay, so that's a bold statement while he's, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I just want you to know that this is the way it's going to be. I'm super confident in it. I'm going to tell the king. I'm just going to put myself out there. And, and at his word, Elijah could have been beaten by the king for this. Just publicly humiliated. We could have been executed. I mean, seriously, you're stepping up in front of the king and you're just going to tell him this is the way it's going to be. And he walks right up to Ahab and he says, listen, I'm turning off the spigot for the whole kingdom. That's it. Water's done. The prosperity that both you and your people that, they're good, that have right now, that you're enjoying right now, it's going to take a big hit. And it's, and it's not going to change until I say so. <laughs> How many knows Elijah's not winning popularity contests right now? Where, where, did, where did he get that kind of confidence? In, this, in his statement, it makes it very clear. He says, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. The word Lord there in the Hebrew text is the name Yahweh. Everybody say Yahweh. Yahweh. The name Yahweh is the name by which God identified himself to Moses. While Moses is standing in front of the burning bush in the wilderness, receiving a call to deliver God's people out of Egypt, Egypt, he says, what if I go to your people and I tell them who sent me? Well, and, and they ask me what your name is. What should I tell them? And he says, yeah, I, Elijah says, or Moses says, listen, I need to come in somebody's name. I can't do this on my own authority. I can't do this on my own power. I'm talking to you. There's, there's not enough power in the name Moses to deliver anybody. There's not enough power in the name Jason to deliver anybody. There's not enough power in the name Jason to deliver a good word to you today. Mm. So whose name? will I be going in? Whose power will I be operating in? God said to Moses, I am who I am is what you're supposed to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. The Hebrew phrase I am is translated Yahweh, our Lord, or Yahweh or Lord in our Bibles today. And it means simply this, to be or to exist, to be, or to exist. Here's what God is telling Moses in this moment. Tell them that I am the God that exists. Tell them that you've seen thousands of false gods before, but I'm the one that actually exists. Tell them that I'm the, actually, the one that's actually alive. I'm the one that created everything you see. And I did not only create it, but I sustain it. I keep it all going. I am uh, that I am. I am Yahweh. Listen. The name Yahweh tells us some things about God that we need to know here. See, it tells, him, tells us that he's sovereign. In other words, there's nothing outside of his control. There's nothing that ever catches him off guard. There's nothing ever that says, oh, wow, wow, I didn't see that coming. I'm, I'm so surprised by all that. No, nothing surprises God. The name Yahweh declares the self-existence of God. In other words, he is not dependent on you, and he's not dependent on me. He's God all by himself. You and I depend on God for everything, including our next breath. But he's not dependent on anything or anyone. He's self-sustaining. You and I, we need food and we need drink and we need shelter and he doesn't need our approval to exist. He doesn't need any food to exist. He is God all by himself. Whether everybody in Israel realized it or not, he was still God. Whatever anybody else in the world realized it or not, he's still God. 
They don't have to acknowledge it. They don't even have to believe in him. He's still God anyway. He brought his into existence everything that is. Nothing brought him into existence. He's always been and he always will be. He is the I am. He is Yahweh. He is the self-existent one. That's the God we serve. That's the God we worship. Where do I get my confidence from? It's from the great I am. So when Elijah... He walks into the Ahab's throne room. He says, he says, I'm not coming on behalf of myself. I can have a lot of confidence here. I come on behalf of the I am. What does that mean? I want you to get it. Listen, what does it mean? It means that whatever you need him to be, that's what he is. He says, I am healing. I am peace. I am the rock. I am the mighty God. I am the mighty counselor. I am the prince of peace. I am a companion to the lonely. I am a father to the fatherless. I am comfort to the hurting. I am whatever you need him to be this morning. I am that I am. I don't need you to exist. I don't need them to exist. I just want you to know that I am everything that you need me to be. There is no one beside me. What a revelation that is. I'm the only one that has ever, that ever was. The only one that ever will be. Elijah's confidence flowed from the fact that he came in the name of the one who controlled all things. Huh. God, I'm struggling with my confidence. I'm struggling with who I am. We take some lessons from Elijah here. There's a little detail buried in this text, and it makes the power of God even more plain. It says this. They believed that Baal was that God, Baal was their God that was, gonna, that was able to control his, it was his job to control the rain. And according to them, part of his divine power was displayed by releasing the rain and causing their crops to grow. But God speaks through Elijah to show Ahab and everybody else that the rain belongs to the Lord of Lords. Not Baal. See, God says to his prophecy, prophet, it comes at my command. Rain is released at my command. It will not stop. It, it will not start again until I command it to. I'm about to shut it off for a season, and I'm going to show you who I really am. But the source of Elijah's confidence is his faith in the one true living God. The strength of your confidence depends on its source. I will tell you this. If your confidence is based off of your bank account, you will not have the boldness of Elijah because your money will come and go. If your confidence comes from your job title, it's not going to have, you're not going to have the boldness of Elijah because jobs come and jobs go. If your confidence is in your neighborhood that you live in or the car you drive or the social circle that you run in or the college you got into or the skills or the abilities that you have, then your confidence can be stolen from you in a moment because those things are temporary. They can be taken away at any time. The Bible calls it wood, hay, and stubble. One day those things are all going to burn away. One, thing, one day those things will all disappear. But he says, if you put your confidence in me, if you put your trust in me, I promise you, I'll pick you up and I'll carry you in your toughest seasons. I promise you, I'll put you on my back and I'll make sure that you're going to be okay. You don't ever have to feel alone. You don't ever have to feel afraid. You don't ever have to feel like you're hopeless. God says, if you'll trust in me, I'll carry you. Can I ask you today, where do you find your confidence? One last question for us to evaluate today. As we find it in the last few verses that we'll study together in this text. Let's read it together. First Kings 17, 2 through 4. Then the 
Word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, that I, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. The next verse. So he did what the Lord told him. And he went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the mornings and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Here's the question that I have for you. The third and final. Are you willing to go there? See, God gave Elijah specific instructions. I want you to leave here. And I want you to go eastward and I want you to hide in the ravine. And it's there that the ravens will feed you. See, it had to happen just that way. As long as he stayed in that place, exactly where God told him to be, he had everything he needed. But can I tell you something? Elijah would have starved to death if he hadn't have gone to that ravine. If he wouldn't have gotten what God promised to give him, if he hadn't have gone there, write this down. Obedience positions you for provisions. Some of us are, are crying out to God for provision. And he's saying, okay, just obey the last word that I gave you. But God, God, I, I don't, I don't want to go there. But, but the bread and the meat, it went to the ravine. It didn't go anywhere else. See, if Elijah had decided, I'm going to go hide, but I'm going to hide in the north, he would have starved to death because God commanded the ravens to head to a specific destination. And Elijah didn't get to set the destination. I am preaching to you whether you're receiving it or not. Elijah didn't get to set where the provisions were going to be. Elijah didn't get to decide where the miracle was going to happen. He only got to choose whether or not he was going to obey. I want to ask somebody this morning, are you willing to go there? No, I'm not talking about moving to another city or another town. I'm talking about, are you willing to obey God's voice? And I don't know exactly where there might be for you today. And it could be something like this. Well, God, I, I, I want a new job and I want a promotion. And God's like, okay, well, over there, over there, I want you to be honoring your boss. And, and, and I want you to get there early. I want you to stay late and I want you to work hard. Oh God, I always wanted a promotion, but I didn't want to go there. <laughs> That's a little bit much to ask. He says, God, I want, you, I, want you to, I want you to save my marriage. He says, okay, all right, I got this over here. It's this ravine. And this ravine right here is where it's at, where it says, I, I want you to forgive them. And, and I, want you to, I want you to take responsibility for your own actions. And I want you to do your part the best you can. But, but God, don't you realize, no, no, I can't go there. I mean, I want, you to, I want you to do what, help me where I'm at. Save me where I'm at. Do answer my prayer where I'm at. God, give me, God, give me a financial breakthrough. God, please, I need a financial breakthrough. And God says, okay, I've got that for you. And it's right over here. And it's in this ravine. And it's, and it's called honestly giving your tithes and your offering. And it's called being a good steward with what you've already gotten. But no, God, no, I'm looking for a miracle right here. I mean, I ain't trying to move. I ain't trying to go over here and do what you've told me to do. I need the provisions where I'm at. And he says, no, 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 no. You have to obey. You have to follow my will. And when you follow my will, I will then send provisions to this exact destination that I put in place. Somebody says, I want to be saved. <sighs> There's somebody saying, I, I need a power. I need a... I need the Holy Ghost. I need, I need something in my life. And he says, he says, okay, I've got a very specific place. It's called Acts 2 and 38. It's repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Receive the gift of the Holy Ghost right there. Somebody says, I need power. I'm having trouble withstanding temptation. I'm having trouble getting through this life by myself. He says, oh, I got a gift for you. I got a gift, and it's called the gift of the Holy Ghost, and it's right over here. And the way to get to that gift is if you get to this destination and you obey Scripture, if you'll do that, I'll take care of you. And I'll give you a gift that will make sure that you have the power to do what you need to do here on earth and make it to heaven in the process. 
Somebody says, oh, I don't know about doing all that. I mean, just today. I mean, I don't know. And he says, okay, if you want what you're asking for, I've got a specific place for you to get it. Acts 1 and 8 says you will receive power when you receive, when the, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Well, that's the answer, folks. If you don't have that, today's the day to get it. Somebody says, I'm ready. I'm ready, God. I'm ready to do it. He says, I've got a place for you. And I'm going to assure you that today is your day to go there. We'd like a blessing from God, but we don't always get excited going where he said we need to go to get it. But can I tell somebody today, the raven is there. The meat is there. The provision is there. The question is, where is you're there and are you willing to go God's speaking to some of you here this morning he's talking to you about some things that he that you've been praying and he says I you've asked the question God are you hearing my prayer I know if you're honest today and I don't want you to raise your hand if you're honest today there's a time you're saying God I just don't know if you're listening and he's saying oh I'm listening but I've given you some instructions, and many times we're hoping to God that we can stay where we're at and receive the provision. And he's saying, please, if you'll just trust me, if you'll go to the ravine, if you'll find yourself in the ravine, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to send everything that you need. The question is, are you willing to obey? I'd ask if you'd all stand across the room. While you're standing, if you'd close your eyes for just a moment, please. For many of you, it's time to evaluate and change what you're seeking first. For many of you, it's time to put your confidence fully and completely in God. It's time to go there, to stop obeying partially and commit to completely doing the will of God. Maybe it's time to be baptized in Jesus' name and receive the glorious gift of His Spirit living inside of you. Maybe it's time to open up your heart to do His will for the next chapter in your life. I'm thinking somebody here today is saying, I'm ready for some boldness. I'm ready for some confidence. I've lost my confidence, God. I've lost my boldness. I don't know where it's at, God. I'm ready. I will say this for you today. Most of you in this room, the road to there goes through this altar this morning. I ask you if you would join me now and say, God, I'm ready to answer the call.